On this episode of Autism Stories, we talk to Sydney Edmond to discuss her advocating for the use of AAC, her love of painting and writing, and being a contributor to the book Life After Lockdown That Resets Perceptions of Autism. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Today I get to interview Sydney Edmond and her her mom Lisa will be reading the her answers to my questions. So my first question just kind of starting out, where does your story in the autistic community begin, Sydney? Thank you, Doug, for inviting me to speak on your podcast. I am so glad to have this opportunity. To answer your question, I popped out autistic, I think. I was lovely and loved, but I had hypotonia that made me slower to sit up and to crawl. I did, however, learn to say the words normally and to engage in activities like babies do. And I did develop the ability to sit up and walk and such. But after an early vaccination, I soon lost the ability to speak and point and engage with people. I was terribly sick with congestion too. The doctors just ignored that I was regressing, focusing instead on my congested lungs. Eventually, I was poured into the diagnosis of autism. I went to specialists and therapists and special needs classrooms. I learned the Picture Exchange Communication System, or PECS, and Applied Behavioral Analysis, or ABA, like all the other kids with autism. But I hadn't yet been diagnosed with apraxia, which kept me from being successful. I could not control my movements to point and communicate what was in my mind. I needed tactile input and encouragement to have any control over my movement. It wasn't until I was 10 years old that I was introduced to supported typing, a form of alternative augmentative communication, or AAC. By having the tactile input I needed, I was able to point to letters on a letter board to say exactly what I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it. For the first time, I was able to fully express myself. I soon learned to type on a keyboard with voice output so it would speak aloud what I had typed. Then I began mainstream classes and writing poetry and speaking at conferences. Years had I waited and now at last I became a contributing member of society. I want to say that in spite of my great love for writing and painting, my greatest passion is to speak out, to make supported typing or AAC a mainstream part of the school system. So it will be available for everyone. So this is where my autism story began to have wings. In preparing to talk with you, I learned that you have several interests that have very little to do with the spoken word, and one of them is painting with watercolors. How did you go about learning this skill? I was inspired to try painting after visiting the San Diego Museum of Art. I was so excited looking at all the paintings and wondering if I could perhaps paint myself. I was thrilled when I asked my mother if I could try it, and she got out some watercolor paints and paper. I was new at it and unable to even hold the paintbrush properly. I was unable to move my arm to apply the paint, but mom gave me the support, the tactile input I needed the same support she gave me when I was learning to point to letters on the letter board when I was learning to type. The same support she gave me when I attempted to learn piano and dance. My first painting was of a tree. Mom thought 
it showed enough artistry to continue. Eventually, I taught myself how to daub on the paint with a minimal tactile input to battle the apraxia. We took some of my paintings to a watercolor class at an art museum, and the teacher encouraged me to continue. She felt I had a unique painting style and a strong artistic voice. I was so happy. So over the years, I have continued to explore new methods and paints. I love painting so much. I hope to keep it up my whole life through. Now, there are many talented autistic artists out there. And I bring this up because you've had your wonderful paintings featured in exhibits. For our listeners, they may want to have their paintings one day featured in exhibits. What would be your advice to them? I began my exhibiting in the town where I live, Temecula, California. It was a monthly event called Art Off the Walls, where eager local artists set up booths to display and sell their art. It was so loud and crowded, it was very hard for me at first. I wore headphones to lower the volume. I became more used to it in time and eventually became known to people who worked for the city. They invited me to exhibit my paintings at one of the libraries in town and later at an art gallery in downtown Temecula. I was also invited to exhibit at the other library in town the Grace Melman Library, where I currently have my paintings on display. Wanting to expand my public, I applied to participate in an art event called Artscape, which is coordinated by the County of Riverside. I was accepted. Held in the Riverside County Administration Center, I have participated in this biannual exhibit many times. Recently, I connected with the organization, The Art of Autism, and through them, I have been asked to exhibit a number of times. Most recently, at the beautiful Oceanside Museum of Art. I was thrilled to be a part of this event. I would recommend to your listeners that they Google, quote, artist opportunities for artists in their area to start and then look wider and wider to county and state. I regularly check calls for artists on the California Arts Council website. And how can people learn more about your art and purchase it? Well, I have a public Facebook page where I share my artwork. It is called Sydney's Art with an Autistic Twist. I also have my work available on a website called Redbubble. They sell quality prints of my paintings, as well as other products and clothing with my artwork. From what I understand, another interest of yours is poetry. In fact, you've had your poetry that discusses your paintings together in some of the exhibits. I'm wondering what concept comes first? Is it the painting or the poetry? Well, I almost always have some poeticizing going on in my brain, but it doesn't get written down until the painting is finished. I have painted poems, but most often the painting is revealed first. I'm wondering about poetry as a helpful form of communication for some non-speaking folks. If poetry is helpful to someone to communicate their thoughts and feelings, what is it about poetry that you think would, that would allow people to do so? I don't know if poetry is the best way to express how I'm feeling. It is more of a creative outlet for me. I began playing with poetry almost right away after I learned to point to letters on a letter board. I loved alliteration of letters and fun to play with words 
after being denied for so long. I express my feelings like most people by saying what I feel and why. It is important to be able to do this. And this is why I speak out to the public so often about the particularly precious need to give all non-speakers a means to fully communicate. I read one of your poems and it talked about how you feel linked with animals, feel that connection. In what ways do you feel that connection? Well, for one thing, we are united in our inability to speak. I think when you are unable to express what you know or how you feel, you are generally treated poorly. People look at you with loads of love, perhaps, but they don't generally treat you with respect. I have often said that when I am with someone who cannot support me to type, I feel as though I am a pet. I am loved and cared for, but I have no say in how my day will be spent, no ability to participate in the conversations around me. I am not the captain of my ship, and it's lousy. One of your other interests, it seems, is writing, because you wrote a chapter for a book that came out not too long ago called Life After Lockdown, Resetting Perceptions of Autism. Why was it important for you to write a chapter for this book, and what do you hope people get from reading your chapter in Life After Lockdown? We are just now coming out of a really dark time. The quarantine was important, and it was also frightening. We were all locked in our homes and watching the news about thousands of deaths. It was a very anxious time for me. I keep thinking about how much worse it would have been if I were unable to express my fears aloud very loud in my request that everyone wear a mask around me. So when I was given the opportunity to contribute to the book, Life After Lockdown, I felt it was important to speak for those like me who can't talk. I wanted parents and professionals to be patient and kind and understanding when their child or client who lacks a means to communicate, shows fear or frustration when they go back into society. We are all of us out of practice. We will need time to readjust ourselves. So be patient. Now, interests are critical to our lives for one thing, because they bring things that we're passionate about and we get lots of joy from them. Interests also connect us with others, but socializing with others can be very stressful. What do you think are some of the stressors for non-speakers when socializing and connecting with others? My biggest source of stress under these circumstances is listening and typing at the same time. I will listen to people and then process and think about what they have said. This takes a little time. I also take time to type or to use a letter board to respond. People are often not attentive. They lack patience. I feel their inability to wait. And this stresses me out so that I can't think. And then I type slower or forget what I was saying. It makes me very sad at times. Other times, it makes me angry. You see, I am frustrated at how long it takes me to type, too. But if they show respect and consideration, it is so lovely to have a conversation. You have a group of friends that you call the friendship group who all communicate in the same way that you do. How important is it to connect with people that communicate in the same way you do, and how has that impacted your life? The friendship group began years ago when I was new to typing. 
It was a pretty large group of people who were just as happy as I was to finally have a voice. We were all young and ambitious. We all wanted to change the world. And do you know, I think we have. One of us is a popular author. Some are attending college or university. A couple of us are eager artists. One is an advisor to their local autism society. And we all have taken every opportunity that comes our way to speak at events of having a means to communicate. I believe that having had that circle of friends who cheered me on was invaluable. Having a room full of people who listened intently and patiently to what I had to say built up a confidence in me that might not have come otherwise. I felt that what I said mattered. I felt that I was not alone. I felt encouraged and love. It was a lovely part of my life that I thank God for providing. I pray that all the blessings I have been given in life will come to those who still haven't got a voice, who still haven't got a life, who have no hope of living a purposeful and fulfilling existence. We all deserve a chance. Absolutely, we do, Sydney. And I really appreciate your energy today in, in talking with me. Thanks so much for joining me. It was my pleasure.